Good evening, everyone. And Anne, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, we'd like to say thank you to Anne and everyone here at the New York Society for Ethical Culture for uh, hosting us this evening and letting us take advantage of this truly wonderfully rich uh, auditorium. It's really fun for us to be here. So thank you again. And thank you for all the good work that you're, you and your organization are doing. So what is tonight all about? Well, on the surface, it's about entitlement reform, but really it's about demonstration. We seek to demonstrate at Common Ground Committee that when it comes to public discourse, there is indeed a better way. Now, all the polls that we see out there, and I'm sure all of this resonates with all of you, you know, it, it says that people are really tired of the tone that we are experiencing today and how it constrains our ability to go forward. And uh, many people have given up hope, frankly, that uh, we can change it. But at Common Ground Committee, we have not. Uh, we think that the change indeed can happen. And um, so what, we, what are we doing? We are demonstrating that we can engage in passionate but civil debate without partisan bickering. We can demonstrate by listening to different views, not just taking positions. We can use data and facts to guide our discussions rather than use emotionally charged talking points. We can be alert to points of agreement rather than seeking holes in our opponent's arguments. And we can find common ground and make progress from it without compromising fundamental principles. Now, we believe these things can be demonstrated by both public officials and private citizens. And indeed, the private citizens part is particularly interesting for us because one of the things that's been particularly gratifying about the work that we do is that we have heard about and we've actually seen people change the way they engage in the discourse that they pursue in their own lives as a result of coming to one of our events and seeing what is possible. And indeed, that's how big change happens. People change individually, one by one, and before you know it, everybody's following suit. And indeed, we hope that when you leave tonight, that you too are inspired to embrace that very spirit. Now, speaking of tonight, we're very excited about our program, Common Ground and Entitlement Reform. It's a very thorny issue, but we have assembled a blue chip panel to explore it. Now, as we have from day one, we are partnering, partnering with the Christian Science Monitor, the Pulitzer Prize winning international daily news publication. Now, why the Monitor, you might ask? Well, you really don't have to look any further than the Monitor's motto, which is to injure no man, but to bless all mankind. And you know what? I think we could all agree that's the kind of motto we can really use today. Now, we're also honored to be supporting a recent initiative that the Monitor has launched called Think, Share, Do. And really, this is about gaining insight from either Monitor journalism or activities that the Monitor is involved in, like this event, that inspire you to think perhaps a little bit differently than you have up to this point. And then to share that insight with others, and then perhaps to actually do something about it and to make a difference, to drive change. Now, the Monitor's editor, John Yemma, is our moderator tonight. And I'm going to introduce him. He's going to have a couple of comments and then introduce our other panelists. Now, John became the Monitor's editor in 2008 after 20 years at the Boston Globe, where he ran the online news operation and served stints as foreign editor, Sunday editor, and political editor. He's been a foreign correspondent, a Washington reporter, and he's covered economics, science, and culture during his 35-year career. He's a graduate of the University of Texas, and he has been a Reuter Fellow at Oxford University and a Salzburger Fellow at Columbia University. It is indeed my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. John Yemma. John? Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, all of you, for coming out tonight. I know that the weather was a little inclement earlier, so you may have had transportation issues. I, I got soaked myself, and uh, one of our guests was stuck on the tarmac in, at Logan for quite a while. But we've, we're all here, and we have a very interesting program tonight. Um, if you're not familiar with the format, you have been given this document, and this document is 
the it's basically what uh, my colleague Kraft Bell, whom I'll introduce in a second, has helped us devise, and it's a way of staking out the issues on both sides and then trying to move toward common ground. And what we what we've done by staking out the issues is we've we've attempted to sort of take the conventional wisdom on the left and on the right. But what we want to do in the center is not be conventional in our thinking, but try to actually achieve some kind of a, a, a sense of where we can go and how we can, how we can get things done. Um, this issue of entitlements is one that, uh, you know, if you think about it, just at its most basic level, um, you think about how you say the word entitlement, really. If you can say that you're entitled to something because you paid in, it's, it's your right. Uh, but then there's that other way of talking about entitlements, which is that you're deserving and perhaps acting as though you're deserving even though you aren't. And so it's a loaded term in many ways. And there are many ways of dealing with the issue um, that, that take on ideological slant, but there are also ways of trying to come together to solve the problem. And the problem is pretty clear, I think. The problem is that mm -hmm. entitlements... Uh, as a percentage of the U.S. Uh, government um, budget have been growing ex in an extraordinary way since the Second World War, mm -hmm. and they're up to about 50 percent of the of the budget right now, and um, it's it's one of those issues where, on the one hand, you may need we may need to have more revenue, and on the other hand, we may need to cut uh, in t cut the actual payout of entitlements or there may be some fundamental reforms that can be enacted. So we'll be exploring that tonight with our two guests. Um, the, the first is uh, Senator Judd Gregg. Senator Gregg is currently the CEO of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. And uh, Senator Gregg was a U.S. Senator from New Hampshire from 1993 to 2011. He was governor of the Granite State from 1989 to 1992, and a U.S. representative from 1981 to 89. Um, joining him is Governor uh, Ed Rendell. Uh, governor Rendell is a uh, special counsel to Ballard and Spare and a news analyst on NBC, which you're probably familiar with that. He's been governor of Pennsylvania from 2003 to 2011 and mayor of Philadelphia from 1992 to 2000. Um, and then joining me on the stage is Kraft Bell. Kraft is a management consultant and facilitator. Uh, he's worked with governments and corporations, universities, generals, executives. Tonight he's working with us. Um, he's the creator of a performance-enhancing software called WorkFrames that fosters problem-solving and change management. And he'll be helping listen for areas where we've achieved common ground, and he, he will be jumping in and uh, showing on the screen uh, areas where we think we have come together. Uh, and then uh, finally, or actually at the beginning of the program too, um, we're going to go to uh, my colleague, Gail Russell Chaddock in Washington, D.C. She's going to be linked by Skype, and you should be able to see her up on this screen. Gail is the Deputy Washington Bureau Chief of the Monitor, a veteran con Congress watcher, congressional correspondent, you can see she's done cover stories in the Monitor on Nancy Pelosi and on John Boehner. Um, she has a great historical perspective. She has also served as Paris Bureau Chief and National News Editor of the Monitor and was a political science professor at Bennington and uh, Wesleyan and Swarthmore. So um, do we have Gail linked in? I'd like to. Hey, Gail. Yes. How are you doing? Hi, John. How are you? Great. Um, Gail, I thought we would go to you first. Just well, first, I have to mention that Gail is actually from New Hampshire. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Gail's from New Hampshire. Uh, Gail, help us frame this discussion. I, I think maybe we should look at it in two ways. First, historically and then politically. Maybe historically we can look at that great expansion of entitlements from the Second World War till today. What's behind that? Uh, is it just that uh, politically it's always easier to grant a new entitlement, or is it a kind of a general sense in the American public that more should be done to help people who have needs? And then maybe next we could talk about politically what the political will is right now to actually tackle entitlement reform. Well, I think if you go, if you go back to immediately after World War II, you're coming out of the dust bowl and a recession depression that left people literally starving. And so the sense of you know, the mood of the country 
that government must do something was a critical starting point. It also helped that in the election of 1934, Republicans were routed. You had, in effect, the biggest defeat for the Republican Party in the country's history for any party. So the Roosevelt started with really a capacity to frame something new without a lot of opposition. You saw the Republicans, as Social Security came on the floor, voting against it for procedural reasons, almost unanimously. But when the final bill came up, less than a third of them would vote against it because it was just too powerful an argument given where the country was. Now, fast forward to December 1981, 82, 83, you have the Congress wrestling for two years with a set of numbers that show decisively that the trust funds are going to run out of money in July, just a few months. What to be done? Well, after failing politically, they set up a commission. The commission came up with some ideas. Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, you know, under the pressure of an urgent deadline, agreed on a fix that was to last 30 years. And in effect, it did. We had cash positive from 19, the trust funds were cash positive from 84 until just about 2010. Where are we now? We don't have a one party system. We don't have a dictator. We don't have a massive depression. Nor do we have the conviction that they had in 81 and 82 that these funds were about to run out of money. Now, despite the work of people like Senator Gregg and Kent Conrad, who together on the budget committee tried to educate people for years and years that a crisis is coming. Look at these charts. We must do something. There never was the sense of urgency comparable to that period in 83 until John Boehner created it artificially by declaring that the debt limit would be raised unless we cut the deficit severely. That was a kind of political crisis that has now, I think, lost its edge. And ironically, just to sum up the political situation, we're in a situation where we have a Democratic president who, to the horror of a lot of his Democratic base, offered up some concessions on Social Security, a tweak in the cost of living adjustment that actually would, over time, be very significant. And it's, in effect, going nowhere. The budget that this is attached to is going nowhere. The sense of urgency is not there. The reports that the trustees gave out on Friday gave people a breath for a minute. They're not going to run out immediately. It's not quite as desperate as it looked. But without that sense of urgency, it doesn't appear that it is easy or even possible to get entitlement reform seriously on the agenda without the kind of political stunt or trick that John Boehner tried that I think is not going to be easy to do a second time. But, but, but Gail, we're also looking at a situation where the baby boom generation's retiring, where the uh, call on entitlements in Medicare and in Social Security in particular is going to be increasing drastically in the years to come. At least that's what we think. There may be some moderation with uh, the Affordable Care Act on Medicare, but um, that that sense of creating a, a crisis of, of having what is Rahm Emanuel's term that a crisis is something that is an opportunity that never should be wasted. Right. But is there is there anything that can get Congress, you think, to act short of a crisis? I mean, sort of a mature outlook that would say our generation, our children's generation is going to be saddled with this problem if we don't take care of it. You know, I thought so. Um, take the examples of uh, Senator Gregg and Kent Conrad. Neither of them are in the Senate anymore. And in fact, you know, any measure of uh, ideological difference between Democrats and Republicans, it used to be that there was a center. There were people, uh, there were Democrats who were more uh, conservative than some Republicans and Republicans more liberal than some Democrats. Right now, that's no longer the case. And so not only did 
Reagan and Tip O'Neill have time. You know, the fix they came up with lobbed forward 45 years. It has yet to fully take effect, but the baby boom retirement is upon us. We don't have 45 years. And so it's going to take somehow generating that sense of we need to act now. The sooner we act, all of the numbers say, the sooner the, uh, we act, the less the pain for people who are expecting a certain level of benefit. But we also have to generate a political culture that can talk to each other. And that is that is a very serious political problem. We don't have it right now. Okay, Gail, thank you very much. This is the, this is the moment where we hope that that political culture will be talking to one another in the, in the, the uh, persona of our two guests. So thank you very much for joining us this evening, Gail. You're welcome. So uh, the next part of our program, we'll, we'll be working through the uh, common ground uh, agenda. And um, uh, I just wanted to, as we go through it, I think we want to take a look at, uh, if, you, if you've got it in front of you, or Give them five minutes to introduce their pieces. Yeah, we'll go through the, um, the very beginning of the, of the um, agenda, where we look at the realities, then we look at reform, and then we look at how to achieve the goals. But perhaps to begin with, each of you could give us a sort of a five-minute view of where you think we can go to reach common ground on this and what you think the, what you think the big issues are. Um, Senator, would you go first? Sure. Thank you. First, uh, thanks to Common Ground for putting this uh, program together. I, I think it's critical that this type of a discussion occur. We've tried to energize it myself and Governor Rendell for quite a while as co-chairman of a group called Fix the Debt. Uh, which came out of the Simpson-Bowles Commission on which I served and which is headed up by myself, Governor Rendell, Mike Bloomberg, uh, and uh, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles. And it's a, it's a very large group of people who want a comprehensive agreement on getting our debt under control. And it's a pleasure to be here with Governor Rendell, who's been just a, a beacon of common sense in this debate and who I've enjoyed uh, working with. And, Regrettably, I don't think we're going to find a lot of differences. There's going to be an awful lot of common ground here. Um, uh, not regrettably, but I mean, it's going to take the fun out of the program in some ways. We'll make it fun, right? Uh, you know, uh, I, the way I describe this is this. I, first off, Gail did an excellent job of framing the issue. And by the way, I, she covered the Senate, I think, all the years I was there, and she was extraordinary. Uh, reporter in that she uh, extremely in-depth approach to the issue. She always knew probably more than the members of the Senate knew, and so it was always a little dangerous to have her walk walk down through the tunnels with you because she'd ask you questions which she'd have to think about. Um, but uh, President of the World Bank, Bob Zellick, tells a story. He says about four months ago, He's no longer president, he just retired a little while ago. He said about four months ago, he was with the foreign minister of Australia. And the foreign minister of Australia said to him, you know, the United States is one debt deal away from leading the world out of economic, it's out of economic doldrums. And that's absolutely right. The only thing that stands between the United States and a period of extraordinary prosperity, I mean extraordinary prosperity, is our fiscal policies right now. Uh, we are a nation on the cusp of, a, of an explosion of economic growth, driven primarily by this shift in the energy paradigm, where for the first time in 50 years, we are going to be an energy exporter rather than importer. We're going to have the lowest price energy in the world. Uh, none of our competitors in the industrialized world will even be able to come close to us. And as a result, that translates to the whole economy in an incredibly aggressive way. Everything is affected by energy prices. And you couple that with the fact we have lots of liquidity in this nation. We're still the place where all the great ideas come from, whether Apple, Facebook, or my part of the country, uh, biomedicine. And we are an entrepreneurial people. We're just ready to go and try things and take risks. So we're positioned. But what's holding us back is this very significant systemic debt problem which we have. We're on a path if we don't get our fiscal house in order to the same outcome that we've seen Greece go through, Spain go through, Italy go through, and France is going to go through, which is that we've, we are going to add massive amounts of debt which we can't afford to pay off, and which means we will have to do something fundamentally damaging to our economy 
like inflating it, and passing a problem on to our kids, which will lead to a lower standard of living for them. And it's just not right and it's not fair to do it. And the driver of this debt is entitlement programs. It's that simple. Uh, if, you, if you look at the whole panoply of the graphs and charts, it jumps out at you. The three major programs are essentially driving the cost of the government, and they're, that's Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And they are a function of two events. One is the retirement of the baby boom generation already mentioned, where we're going to go from 35 million retired Americans to 70 million retired Americans, doubling the retiree population in this country. And, it will, and they will be fully retired technically by 2017, although because of the times, many won't retire. And secondly, medical technology, which is simply exploding in cost, the, medical, the cost of medical care. So we've got to figure out a way to address the entitlement programs. And running in tandem with that, as Governor Rendell will certainly mention, and I, and I totally agree with, is we've got to repair our tax system. We have to have a tax law in this country which generates a willingness to pay taxes and an incentive to create activity which generates taxes, and we need fundamental tax reform. Can we get the agreement which the foreign minister suggested from Australia? Yes, we can. There's no question about it. Simpson Bowles laid a template out for this. It is extremely doable. We're not talking big numbers here relative to the overall economy. We're talking already, we're talking about $5 trillion over 10 years. That's a lot of numbers. Big number, yes, but on a $45 trillion base, it's about 5%. So it's a very doable, it's about 10%. It's a very doable number. Half of it's already been done, by the way. 2.5 trillion has already been put into the pipeline. We need another 2.5 trillion. That's what we should talk about tonight, how we get there. And I'm sorry to speak so long, but it's a big issue. <laughs> Governor Rendell. Well, first, let me say, Judd makes an incredibly important point. I hear people on my side of the aisle say, well, we can't do entitlement reform. We can't do anything that smacks of austerity because it'll hurt the economy. We've got to keep pumping money into the economy. Well, there's something to that. And if you look at Simpson Bowles, the way it's structured, the, it's a long-term debt deal that phases in gradually. In fact, Simpson Bowles recommends spending money early to fuel short-term economic growth. But what my side doesn't realize is if we're going to have long-term economic growth, we have to resolve this problem because it is the business community, the world business community, that is looking to see whether this country has the, the ability to do a political solution that will give us a stable course to reducing our debt to under 70 percent of GDP. We think actually closer to 60 percent of GDP. If we do that, if we put it in place, even if the cost cutting is down the road, if that plan is locked in, it's going to unleash a lot of money that's on the sidelines now. Uh, Judd spoke about it. I absolutely couldn't agree more. The campaign to fix the debt has over 200 of the nation's top thousand corporate leaders as part of it. And they're doing it not because it will help them. In fact, in many ways, it may increase some of the taxes they pay or remove some of the loopholes. But they're doing it because they want that stability to, to be able to get off the sidelines and invest in real growth. So that's a very important point. It's also important you have a lot of debt deniers who say, well, good, look, revenues are up. Healthcare costs are down. We don't really have a problem. Look at the next 10 years. We don't really have a problem. The GDP, e even with the sequester, the GDP increases just a couple of points from 73%, the, the amount of percentage of debt to GDP, to 79%. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal comes in the second 10 years and the third 10 years, when because of the explosion that Judd referenced, it's going to go off the charts. And by 2050, if we don't do something, we could have debt that's 200% of GDP. And Judd, what's Greece's debt compared to its GDP? It's about 175. About 175. We could be right there, folks. Right there. And your grandkids will have no shot at having a high-quality life. Now, as far as the format tonight, 
this is not a great format. Judd and I are co-chairman of the campaign to fix the debt. We agree on what should be done. I said I tried to talk my way out of this, especially when I found out that the game seven of the Heat versus the Pacers was tonight. I told the, the organizers, you want Bernie Sanders to represent my side. You don't want me. I, Judd and I agree on most stuff. But I will try to play the role of my party and the base of my party a little bit. It's not necessarily something that I agree with, but I'll tell you their perspective. But the last thing I want to say, and then we'll turn it over to the individual issues, is you can't just look at entitlement reform. If we're going to fix the debt, fix this problem, it has to be in the context of everything else. Because if I were king of the world, I would solve the Social Security problem easily. Just uncap it, payroll deduction, pay right up to the every nickel you earn, you pay a payroll deduction. It's now capped at the first $110,000 in, in income. And I would means test it. Solve. Problem solved for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. But that's not feasible. That's not finding common ground. That's my solution. There is no king in America. No party controls. We have to find common ground. And common ground means trade-offs. And if trade-off is change CPI, which, by the way, is actually every economist will tell you it's a more accurate way of pegging inflation than what we have now, if change CPI means that some people will get less in, in, in terms of benefits, as long as we protect the poorest and the oldest, which Simpson Bowles recommends, then it has to be. Because the f political realities mean that we have to do something. That's why you saw President Obama talking about change CPI. Revenue has to be a part of this. We believe that very carefully. So the people who believe that entitlement should be cut severely, they can't get all of that without agreeing to raise revenue. There are the proposal that Governor Romney made to eliminate the tax expenditures that help high wage earners, the deductions, charitable deductions, to cap it at a certain level, cap it at 25,000, cap it at 40,000. That would bring in over the course of 10 years over a half of a trillion dollars. And would anybody suffer? I, I don't think so. So the other side's got to look at things like that as well. So you can't just find common ground within the boundaries of entitlement reform. You've got to find common ground within the boundaries of everything that affects budgeting. Well, let me just say I'm outraged, outraged that you'd express such common sense in this <laughs> I'll start playing the role of Bernie Sanders, so we'll be in good shape. You won't have to apologize again. I'll be... Governor, before we move on, uh, could you help us a little bit with change CPI? Tell, uh, give us a definition of it, a quick uh, couple ahead, of sentences. Uh, change CPI is really pretty simple. What it essentially says is that it factors in human, the human response to prices and price increases. Uh, on the present CPI, uh, the Labor Department will look at the cost of, let's say, bread. And if it goes up 500 percent, they'll assume a 500 percent increase in CPI. Well, you know if bread goes up 500 percent, people are going to stop buying bread. They're going to buy something else. So chain CPI reflects human reaction to a major price spike and is a much more accurate way to get the CPI correct. And it will have virtually no impact on present-day retirees because for all intents and purposes, there is no projected CPI going forward because we're at a flat number. Uh, there is no inflation. Uh, where it works and why it's so important is in the second 10 years, in the third, third 10 years. It's, you know, Einstein said that the most incredible thing in, in the world was interest because it compounded. Well, change CPI compounds, and it compounds really aggressively in like the third 10 years. It's a multi, multi-trillion dollar event. And, and it's critical that we move in that direction. Okay. It's so an honest way to get an accurate CPI. Okay. So uh, let's... It, al it also has the effect of reducing some spending programs as well. It raises taxes, too. And it raises taxes as well. So it raises revenue, reduces spending, reduces entitlements to a more accurate level. Okay. Um, let's, let's move on through the program, then. Um, Kraft, help me with this a little bit. We're going to, if, if you want to jump in to do any explanation, the main thing is that there are three areas that we're going to look at, and the th where we really want to go is the third area, how to achieve these goals. So first, we're going to look at the current realities, just a general sense um, from, from your points of view of how we're doing on the, um, 
on it, how, what entitlements mean in terms of impact on well-being, on the budget, and on the deficit. And then the second will be goals for reform, security and fairness, uh, deficit reduction, economic growth. And then, then the real payoff will be the, um, uh, how we actually achieve these goals and, uh, and where we can move with that. So um, just starting with the current realities, when you think about this, um, on one side, there's a view that uh, the most vulnerable need to be protected by entitlements. And I, I think we probably have a consensus on, on that being the case. But on the other side, and I think you did a good job of framing this up, um, we want to prevent economic disaster because if, uh, if entitlement reform goes on unchecked, it starts to crowd out other kinds of spending, infrastructure. We have bridges collapsing almost every day in America, uh, defense spending, um, education. Um, so looking, just looking at those two areas, I, I think I sense that, there, that you have a general feeling that we've got to keep the basics of, entitlement, of entitlements because we've got to have that safety net for Americans, especially during bad economic times, but that we've got to have some degree of control over spending. I think that's a very accurate uh, assessment of it. Right now, we, in 2012, we paid $454 billion of interest on our debt, more than the federal government pays for education, infrastructure, transportation, agriculture, and housing. Think about that. And that's only going to grow and grow and grow and grow if it's unchecked. So I think you you sort of framed the issue of where we need to go and why we need to go there. And we can do it. If you look at Simpson Bowles, Simpson Bowles protects most of the domestic spending that's really earmarked for the poorest and oldest and disabled Americans. And even on chain CPI, it builds in protection for the oldest and the poorest people receiving Social Security. We can do it and still have a solid safety net. Yeah, it's a straw dog to set them against each other, the, the low-income recipient of entitlements and the need to control the rate of growth of entitlements. You can easily control the rate of growth of entitlements. You're not talking about cutting anything here, by the way. You're talking about controlling the rate of growth of entitlements without affecting any moderate, low-income individual in any significant way. Uh, what you need is lead time to put in place the changes and what Simpson Bowles suggested, and what people who think about this in, in some depth suggest, is that you want the economy, you don't want the economy to be suddenly braked by a significant reaction of cutting on entitlements or even on discretionary spending. And the sequester is right. extremely counterproductive for that purpose. What you want instead of that is the sequester should be replaced by entitlement reform, which kicks in 5, 10, 15 years from now. We don't have the immediate problem that the Europeans have. We have a problem which we know is coming at us 5, 10, 15 years from now. We know that if we don't correct our problem, we will go bankrupt at some point in the future. The markets will lose confidence in our currency because they will know that to get out of this, we're going to have to inflate it, and we will have a financial crisis. Now, when that comes, nobody knows, because nobody ever knows when the market's going to react. But it's clear it's not going to come tomorrow. But if we put in place a proposal like Simpson Bowles, which is comprehensive and has both entitlement reform and revenues, then the markets will look at that and say, OK, they got their house in order. But it won't affect anybody in a significant way immediately. It will give people time to plan for the changes. For example, Simpson Poll suggested we raise the age of retirement by two years. Do you know how long it phased that in over? 60 years. Nobody over the age of 15 was going to be affected by this. You listen to the AARP on this subject, you would have thought tomorrow Simpson Bowles was going to slice everyone off the rolls who was under age 69 because they totally and dishonestly projected, talked about it. The politics of this are what kill it. The well poisoners, as I call them, both on the left and the right, take issues which should be discussed in a comprehensive and thoughtful way, and I purpleize them into single phrases that they use to raise money with. Mm -hmm. And that's their only purpose, is to raise money, by the way. Senator, uh, just, just to follow up on that, and uh, again, I'm, I'm asking this, I'm not expecting you to carry water for the far right of your party, but the uh, members of the Tea Party, uh, a lot of them believe that 
entitlements are counterproductive, that, that somehow they create this culture of dependency, you know, from food stamps to Medicare to uh, even the Affordable Care Act. Um, is, there, is there any sense, is there anything to that other than, I mean, is that just a single issue, or is there any sense? I, I don't there's think there's any significant part of the Republican Party that thinks that Social Security isn't a great program, yeah. that thinks that Medicare isn't a strong and important program. The things that Medicaid, if it were done correctly and turned over to the states, people like Governor Rendell, who knew how to run a program, is versus having the federal government tell you how to do it, isn't it a very strong program? Obamacare, that's another subject. We, we haven't even stepped onto the ground of Obamacare yet for what it's going to cost this country and how it's going to negatively impact the delivery of health care, in my opinion. But that's a subject for another topic. If, but if you don't want to get common ground, it's probably a pretty what good What we'd like subject. to do, if we could just... <laughs> If we could just put this on the screen, the, I'm trying to capture as you go along, and the, you can see it on the screen there, kind of the key things that you've been talking about. Because we want to, when we leave here, to be able to say, here are the common things that we've talked about. So you talked about protecting the vulnerable, yet uh, limiting the rate of growth and the lead times over change, that abrupt changes are counterproductive, handle the second and the third uh, tenure of issues, and provide the st stability that pro uh, fosters growth. Phase in change over many years. Don't let single phrases drive the discussion when the perspective can be gained. Is that a summary? Good job. You got them. Good ready, job. Ready to okay. sign so, on, <laughs> on the dotted line. So we're, we're just talking kind of on the higher level of the current realities. Is there any other, you know, you, you talked earlier about well, I kind think of the balance. There's a, I think there's agreement that you need to replace the sequester, which is counterproductive right. to the exercise, although it's a forcing mechanism, with significant comprehensive reform of entitlements in the tax laws. And the other one I think you mentioned was how, how does taxes fit into this? That You talked about tax reform as a parallel thing well, going on. Tax reform is absolutely necessary. One, because in basic fairness it's necessary, but two, it's necessary to generate significant additional revenue. Of the 2.5 uh, trillion that's left to be raised, I think the general agreement is two, two and a half in spending cuts, counting entitlements, to one in terms of revenue increases. Now, the Simpson-Bowles proposal was $4 trillion over 10 years. $3 trillion of that came in savings, and $1 trillion came through tax reform because Simpson-Bowles did what was called zero-based tax reform, where it essentially reduced or dramatically eliminated almost all the tax deductions. That created $1.1 trillion of revenue a year. A trillion of that was taken and reduced rates. So the rates under Simpson-Bowles were 9, 15, and 23 percent. That was the top rate, or maybe it was 25 percent. Um, and then $100 billion of that every year was taken to reduce debt. So over 10 years, it was a trillion dollars of debt reduction. And that's the type of template that I think you need to, if you're going to be successful in this exercise. Although I think we all agree that that's r risen to $5 trillion. Right. The number now is $5 trillion. The number now is $5 trillion. Not 4 right. It's two years ago it was 4 Okay. Um, shall we move on to the goals yeah. of reform? So I think we've already touched on some of the goals of reform, but, you know, we're trying to balance prudence, fiscal prudence with fairness. Um, Governor, can you say something about how you do that? How, how do we make sure that we, um, that, I mean, is it just about revenue generation and about controlling spending through or controlling entitlements through different mechanisms such as change CPI, or is there, is there some other fundamental reform that has to take place? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, I know this is an expression that everybody uses and everyone says we're going to get X millions of uh, billions of dollars in government efficiency, cutting out waste, fraud, and abuse. And that's usually baloney. Um, but government efficiency and bending back the health care cost curve are very, very important elements. So I think the th a third way is to make government more efficient and effective. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the things, and I don't share Judd's dread, wasn't there a movie, Judge? Judge Dredd. <laughs> I don't share Judge Dredd about Obamacare so much, but I do believe there were a lot of things left on the table by Obamacare, and a lot of those were cost-cutting. Let me just give you one quick, quick example. In Pennsylvania, before uh, when President Bush was president, I actually went up and spent 
a day with Governor Romney with my staff because we were going to intend on duplicating Romney care for Pennsylvania because they didn't think there would ever be national health insurance. And we looked at a number of areas, and we looked at one area that Governor Romney had sort of touched on but hadn't done much, hospital-acquired infections. In Pennsylvania, 2,500 people a year die of hospital-acquired infections. It costs the health care delivery system in Pennsylvania $3.5 billion a year. The average hospital stay in Pennsylvania is $30,000 for the average hospital stay. If you get a hospital-acquired infection, it's $150,000. And all that costs, the hospital doesn't need any of it, gets passed on to the providers or the individuals. So we put in some very strict rules and strict oversight on hospital-acquired infection, and we cut $360 million out of the cost of hospital-acquired infections in the first year. That's a 10% cut. Now, apply that across the nation, and you've got real savings. Well, why wasn't that part of the Affordable Health Care Act? And there are many, many other instances. There are many other ways to drive competition. I think the the um, the um, uh, the exchanges are a good way to drive competition, but there are other ways to drive competition that we left on the table. So government efficiency, government savings, real stuff, not the BS that politicians talk about, but real stuff I think has to be part of the equation as well. There's gold in that. Okay. Senator, do you see something similar to that? Yeah, I just want no, to go back. You said $2.5 trillion in spending cuts and and a trillion dollars of tax enhancement. Enhancement's a, uh, a hot-button word. It's not enhancement, it's tax reform. Um, the, there is no question that... And it's the, not, sorry, if I can interrupt, it's not loopholes, it's tax expenditures. Yeah. Loopholes by any other name. Um, and it's having a tax law that incentivizes people to invest rather than avoid taxes. Uh, the, the, this whole issue of health care is at the essence of how you get the federal deficit under control, how you get federal spending under control. It's incredibly complex. Unlike Social Security, which only has four or five moving parts, and which Ed and I could fix in 15 minutes, right. really, literally. Uh, everybody knows how to fix it. It's just the politics that keeps it from being fixed. Health care is a constantly moving target. It's an incredibly complex matrix of moving parts, and it's driven by, the costs are driven by two things, the dramatic aging of our population and the explosion in technology in the healthcare industry. The fastest growing demographic group in America today, do you know what it is? It's people over 100 per capita, people over 100. Second fastest growing demographic group in America today, people over 80. Uh, and those folks can be expensive. And you've got to figure out a health care system that can deliver quality health care to them without rationing. And so it's a real challenge. Um, there's a lot of really good work being done, but it's coming from the bottom up. And one of the problems with Obamacare is it's a, it was put together by a bunch of staffers in Washington who thought that they could fix things from Washington top down because they were smarter than everybody else. Well, they're not. Uh, most of the really good ideas in health care are coming from health care providers, provider groups. Uh, there's a group, a consortium, up in Han that's centered out of Dartmouth, which involves the Mayo Clinic and Baylor and uh, major hospital centers, Salt Lake City, Pittsburgh. Uh, there are about 30 hospitals. They cover about 70 million patients. They've been studying for years the, how, how procedures are done. And taking just a simple procedure like a knee replacement, Across these hospital groups, which are the best in the country and technically the most efficient in the country, they're not, they're not factories that are trying to make money. Uh, a knee replacement can, cost can vary from $2,000 to $20,000, but the outcomes will be the same. Hmm. So what they're trying to do is through st their statistical analysis and setting up procedural uh, procedure uh, protocols, figure out how across the system you, they can get the $2,000 delivery as versus the $20,000 delivery. They've also come up with a very unique approach, which I think is really the direction we have to go in Medicare, 
Most Medicare controls are top-down, and they're driven by the OMB, which will only score a top-down approach. Top-down, I mean you cut the doctors 10 percent, or you force patients, recipients of Medicare, to have their premiums increased. Those are top-down. They're very inefficient, and they don't produce results. What this consortium has come up with is what they call a withholding approach, where they essentially say to a hospital system, okay, we're going to pay you 80% of the cost of this procedure, because we know that that's about what it really should cost. And to the extent that you get your cost down towards that 80%, we're going to give you part of the 20% you missed. So it's an incentive, it's a carrot rather than a, than a club, and it's a much better way to approach, approach it. But all this is evolving constantly. It's, it's moving all the time. And what we need is more flexibility out of Washington to allow the legitimate health providers in this country to pursue options and opportunities in states to take control over Medicaid. And no question what Judge said is, is correct. But to talk about common ground, what we need to do in this is to find ways to amend Obamacare. I mean, this idea, this exercise that the Republicans in the House go through, talk about wasting money. It's what, 38 times they've repealed Obamacare? Ridiculous. But the president should reach out and say, look, I know there's some things that can be improved. There are some changes we can layer in. There's some cost savings that we didn't have time to put in. Let's open it up to a real discussion, not just with Republicans and Democrats, but let's bring in some of those health care professionals. And let's find a way to get the individual to have a little stake in the game. I mean, if you've ever seen a senior citizen go to the supermarket, they'll have a magnifying glass to check the prices. And then when they check out, they'll take out the receipt and make sure every item is included in the bag. Yet they'll leave a hospital without even bothering to look at the bill. No stake in the venture. So there are so many things we can do, and we need to have a process which opens up and changes and amends with the best ideas that are out there. The president shouldn't have pride in authorship. The Republicans should understand that some form of the Affordable Health Care Act is here to stay. That would be common ground that would actually produce some positive results. Great. Kraft, we have a uh, summary now? Uh, yeah, if we could just look at, you went through uh, quite a lot of ground fairly quickly. Uh, so if we could put it up on the screen, we have uh, government efficiency in bending the health care cost curve. Uh, cost cutting, for instance, the hospital acquired infections is part of the health care improvement. Health care is crucial but very complex with aging population and health care costs. Bottom up improvements work better than top down staff driven change. Bottom up specific health care efficiencies that are being demonstrated in the medical profession. The top down is an efficient uh, shared savings, uh, is a better way that comes with flexibility uh, from the health care providers. Typing real fast here. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. And uh, the states, not just the health care providers, uh, and that's where the control should be, like in Medicare. Social Security, you talked about, could be fixed with the CPI reductions. And then find ways to uh, amend Obamacare, you know, make it work, get a broad consensus, provide incentives, and the participants have a stake in the outcomes. Is that? Spring. Well, Social Security. Uh requires more than just CPI adjustment, but that's CPI and point. It requires more. Yeah. It requires probably, again, to... You, you were saying it was simple simpler, compared to the others, so I was trying... It is simple compared to the others, one, but, yeah, but... CPI isn't the only action. I think we do have to, if not totally uncap the limit on payroll deduction, at least raise it. I think we've probably got to increase the age as well. Social Security was never meant to cover 20 years of life. It's uncapping the I, th I think you probably just put down there four or five actions needed rather than getting okay. specific, but there are four or five things, and raising the bend point, changing the bend points is one of them, which is means testing. And CPI is one of them. Raising the age is one of them, and raising probably the tax rate on to some per higher percentage is probably, of income is probably one of them. It's just doable. It's the path. It's very, very doable. Okay, thank you. So, Kraft, I'm going to suggest that maybe we, instead of doing a, an overview of three, we move on. Go to the to, detail? Yeah, we'll go into the details. So, now let's. Go back. Go ahead. Pardon? 
Now let's try to, to drill down on each of these uh, areas, say Social Security. I mean, this is really what we're talking about here, the, the need to kind of get specific, right? On Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and um, to the extent that we can on health care only in the, I mean, in, in, I realize that by bringing the Affordable Care Act into it, it complicates things. But um, when you look at the, the two polls here, uh, one side sees the programs um, as essential to diminishing poverty among the elderly, Social Security and Medicare in particular. I mean, these were terrible problems before these programs came along, and they helped the poor and the uninsured, especially during economic downturns. Um, well, on the other side, the growing costs impairs their quality, promotes dependency. Maybe that's not as big an issue, um, Senator, as, as uh, we had assumed, but uh, it impairs their quality and it crowds out private sector spending. So just looking at, say, Social Security, um, we've touched on some of the common ground. Do you, is this a place here, Kraft, do you think maybe we, could, we should look carefully at the individual ways of working on Social Security? Which we've yeah, I think if, that. if they can go ahead and talk through that, I can capture it. All you have to do is adopt the Simpson Bowles position. Mm -hmm. Bowles made Social Security solvent for 75 years, did not do it in the context of debt reduction. Okay. It is a sidecar. And it had, I think, four basic elements. One was change the CPI, one, one to change CPI, second was raise the age, third was change the bend points, and fourth, I think it, it may have raised to some degree the, the number at which the the Social Security tax kicks in, kicks out. It didn't change lift it completely. Points. What was the third one of those? You, you said know, you said change the what points? Bend points. The bend points. That's called means testing. Okay. 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 Yeah, we're about means testing Social Security. When I was a young man, I ran for governor the first time. Got clobbered, but I was uh, talking to one of my best contributors, a man by the name of Bill Fishman who started ARA, the Worldwide Food Service country, Company. And he had just turned 65. It was my bad luck that a month later I went to see him to try to get him to write me a big check for governor. And he was so irate because he had gotten his first Social Security check the month before. He sent it back to the federal government saying, I make $47 million in dividend income and in, in uh, uh, my stock options. $47 million, I do not need this, apply it to some other use. They sent it back and said, we have no ability to, to uh, do that. You have to take it. You have to cash it. You'll be committing uh, not a, a criminal offense, but some offense if you don't cash the check. He, he was furious. I couldn't get him to concentrate on a thing. But well, why should someone who's getting $47 million a year in income get Social Security? It's ridiculous. But, but means testing is one of those third rail issues, isn't it? Well, it is for the AARP because the Social Security was conceived as an insurance program. Uh, the theory was that you would pay a premium throughout your working life and then you'd have a right to a benefit structure. Uh, well, it would be easy to craft it, though, Judd. You say, if that person is getting $47 million a year in income, if his income falls below a certain level, he gets not only the yearly supplement, but everything going back to when he t turned age eligible, if that ever happened. I mean, so that's the way you would... Well, I'm sure it could be crafted, but I'm just saying that, that the philosophy behind why Social Security has never been fully means tested and is not an income transfer event, and is not seen as an income transfer event, right. is that it was an insurance program. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of historical precedent for trying to keep that differential. Mm -hmm. but, but it's interesting. Almost all of these problems, we always say that it's not rocket science, and it isn't rocket science. When um, raising the Social Security age came up, Nancy Pelosi, who I have enormous amount of respect for, I think she's done some wonderful things in her career and has helped this country immeasurably. When Nancy, though, reacted the way our base always reacts and said, well, what about that woman who's a chambermaid at a hotel and has spent 40 years making up other people's bed and has a bad back. You're going to tell her she has to work two more years? Well, that's a good point. We could do a carve out based on income. And if your income was below a certain amount for the last 10 or 15 years, then you get it at the old age factor. That would be a small enough slice that you'd still get most of the benefits for it. 
So if people of goodwill try to work on problems together and not react, as Judge said, with slogans, I think all of this is doable. Okay, so let's just go back for a second. Simpson Bowles is out there, all right? So if we know the answer, then what's the question? The question is, how do you get people to take what's an obvious answer and work it through? I mean, so it's like, where's the common ground on how we would deal with that? Well, you need leadership. It's that simple. Uh, you need to be able to give members on both sides the cover they need to make the tough votes on Social Security when they're going to be facing attacks from people who are totally irresponsible on the issue. Uh, and Social Security is so easily re resolvable that, it, substantively, that it, the only thing that is missing is the politics that are necessary to resolve it, and the politics aren't there because nobody's willing to stand up to groups that use Social Security either as a primary political weapon or a primary funding raising. So, well, wasn't Simpson Bowles originally supposed to be like the base closing commission? It was going to be one of these one of these commissions that would be above politics. What what happened? Uh, it lost that statutory imperture. Uh, in a vote in the Senate, and so it became a presidential commission without any executable procedural requirement. However, it was followed by the super committee or the special committee, which did have the statutory right to take by fast track a proposal to the floor of the House and the Senate and have it voted on with 51 votes and pass, but the special committee or super committee uh, which was chaired by uh, Senator Murray and uh, Congressman Henserling, uh, did not reach an agreement because they were firing real bullets, I guess. And yeah, maybe so. Well, so, I, I, would you agree with what uh, Bob Dole said on Fox News the other day? He was, they had an interview with him, and his basic premise was that the cover issue you just talked about is the most mm -hmm. crucial because he said he would put him, put him in a room and he'd say, okay, here's where we're headed. You guys figure it out. And when you get done with this, I'll protect you and you're, you know, with the... Yeah, Social Security, that's a classic example of it. You have to have the president supporting a proposal which will change CPI, which he has done, and will allow the age to be increased. And that gives everybody cover to vote for that because he's a Democratic president. And in return, you've got to say to the Democratic base, if this ever is going to work, President Obama has the toughest task of all. Everyone says John Boehner's got to deal with his caucus. Well, John Boehner doesn't have to get 50% of his caucus. We can pass it just as we passed the fiscal cliff, with 75 Republicans voting for it and 170 Democrats voting for it. What President Obama's got to do is much tougher. He's got to go into the heart of the Democratic Party and say to them, look, the Rolling Stones said it best, you can't always get what you want. But if you try, sometimes you'll get what you need. And, you know, we've got to solve this problem. And so we're going to give on Social Security a little bit. We're going to give on Medicare a little bit. We're going to protect vital domestic programs. We're going to protect the, the most vulnerable recipients of Social Security and Medicare. And we're going to get revenue. And we're going to get revenue from the people we've been talking about getting revenue from all the time. Not from the middle class. How many people in this room, how many people in this room claim more than $25,000 a year in deductions, charitable deductions. Raise your hand. And this, my guess is, is a fairly affluent cross-section, and four of you raised your hands. So we'll make it $40,000. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. I mean, we can do this, but it really does, Judd hit it absolutely right. It takes leadership, and the ball is in the president's court. Well, Ball is in the president's court. I might have a bit of a difference on the revenue side, but relative to so Social Security, I don't have a difference of opinion. And uh, this is, it's really discouraging that this issue can't be resolved. And, and you know, the way we did it in Simpson Bowles is we took it out of the deficit debate. I mean, we pulled it out of the deficit debate. We didn't use anything we did in Social Security for the purposes of using the debt, addressing the debt from a scoring mechanism. We simply made it solvent for 75 years. But you know the reason Simpson-Bowles wasn't accepted by the White House? It was because 
the House Democratic leadership went down to the White House and said, you can't sign on to Simpson-Bowles because it will take Social Security off the table for the next election, and we need it to win the next the House back. Which, of course, irony of ironies, the only demographic group that, age-wise that uh, Governor Romney carried was senior citizens. <laughs> Great irony. Yeah. Uh, just a quick time check. We're going to go to questions from the audience in about five minutes. So uh, we're really going to, I think, try to look, let's, let's maybe just kind of close with a, um, with a look at Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that's a big thing to look at, but using the same kind of um, approach to uh, the, the sort of how we can begin to address this. So Social Security is not, it's not totally simple, but it's much simpler than fixing Medicare and Medicaid. However, give us a sense of how we should be tackling Medicare and Medicaid so that we begin to control those costs too, because they too are skyrocketing. Well, first off, it's simpler by a factor of about $60 trillion, Social Security. The unfunded liability of Medicare and Medicaid is around 60 to $65 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Try to figure out what that means. Well, if you take all the taxes paid in the United States since we started collecting taxes as a government, federal government, 1789, we've paid in about $45 trillion. If you take the entire net worth of America, all our cars, all our houses, all our stocks, all our bonds, that's about $55 trillion. So we have a liability in those two accounts alone that we don't know how we're going to pay for that exceeds our net worth, which is why I've said we're on the path road to bankruptcy. Social Security's unfunded liability is in the $15 trillion range. It's a big number, but it's totally resolvable within the context of a of, of the adjustments we've discussed. The only way you're going to get Medicare, I believe, under control is by changing the paradigm of Medicare so that you move more to a system which rewards outcomes versus utilization. And that means you've got to bring the market into the system because outcomes are determined by market. And uh, that's why I've, I've cited the Dartmouth study earlier, which is basically a market-driven attempt to use a carrot rather than a stick. In Medicaid, the way you do it is you give the states the flexibility to deliver Medicaid without all these rules and regulations which make it virtually impossible for them to do creative things. I mean, I'm sure Pennsylvania, and I know New Hampshire, could do a heck of a lot better job of Medicaid delivery if, we, if the governor were just given the right to do it and given the money that the, and let the federal government fund whatever percentage they are. In New Hampshire, it's less than 50 percent. I don't know what it is in Pennsylvania, but let us figure out how we're going to create capitated expenditures so that when that Medicaid patient comes in to a hospital setting or into a group of doctors, the doctors in the hospital know how much they're going to get from that patient because the state will have told them. You can't do that now. And a capitation program makes much more sense than a cost plus program, especially where doctors aren't going to even see a Medicaid patient because they don't think they get reimbursed at anywhere near what the cost of seeing that patient is. There's lots of different things states can try. I, know, I suspect Pennsylvania did a lot of things, or tried to. Yeah, uh, that, that's correct. And, and you can do things with greater flexibility. You can change them and, and do them more quickly. And the answers, again, the, the answer cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, and Obamacare. F for example, the ability to uh, um, change the way we pay for, for service. A diabetic, and for 75 percent of all of our health care costs come from chronic diseases. A diabetic, right now, the way diabetics are reimbursed, uh, their treatment is reimbursed, is they go to the doctor, the doctor prescribes things, tells them about insulin, etc., and that's it. The next time the doctor sees them is in the emergency room when they're about to lose a leg. There's no management of the disease. There's a method named after a doctor, I think from California, the Wagner method, that 10 states have adopted, we were the 10th, where you pay for managed, truly managed care. So you pay for the original doctor's visit, but then you pay for a pediatrician, not a pediatrician, a, um, a dietitian. So the dietitian works with the patient once a week. How are you doing on the diet, Mrs. Jones? Is it too tough? Do you want to substitute this for that? We can structure something new. There's a physician's assistant that we pay for who makes sure that the injection is the least painful and that they haven't stopped uh, taking blood, drawing blood, and, and monitoring their, their sugar count. 
uh, you pay for the pharmacist. It's a team that manages the disease and manages the disease to keep people out of hospitals. We adopted that in my last two years as governor, and on a yearly basis, we reduced diabetics going into Pennsylvania hospitals by 29 percent, 29 percent, and that's where the diet. You have to get a waiver to do it. And we have to get a waiver to do it. Now, the Affordable Health Care Act does put some money in to encourage states to do stuff like this, but in Medicaid, if it was block granted, states could do it. The danger in block granting Medicaid, the danger in block granting Medicaid is you could get a politician who just says basically, okay, I'll take the federal government money, and the federal government money has to be used to provide health care to the targeted groups, but I'm not going to kick in any state money. Right now, the only way you get the federal money is to kick in state money at whatever the ratio is, and it differs by, uh, from state to state. Okay. Um Bruce is going to come up, and we're going to take questions from the audience now, and we'll, we'll just basically continue to drill down on this via the questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, we have a couple of folks with microphones. Uh, you can raise your hands, and we will uh, answer those questions for you. Also, if you're more comfortable writing your question out, please use the question card in the packet we gave you. You can uh, write that down, and we'll have someone coming up the aisle and uh, picking those up, and we'll go through a few of them and hopefully uh, get them on the floor. So let us begin. I think we have someone over here. Connor? Hello. hello. Uh, I'd like to thank the Society for putting on this event. It's a terribly important and interesting conversation tonight. I'm an attorney, and I work in the field of uh, healthcare public policy. Governor Rendell has had a lot of experience with a somewhat radical group in Pennsylvania called ADAPT. And um, unlike my uh, disabled colleagues around the country, uh, I come from the other side of the political spectrum. And as a Republican, I'm more interested in hearing about issues that promote the individual rights and a market-based solution that would give individuals like me more of an opportunity to control exactly how that Medicaid dollars get spent on an annual basis. You know, I look at what the government spends on my care, and I know that if I had power over how that money got spent, I could save twenty or $30,000 per year, easily. And I would have more freedom, more liberty, and be able to participate in many other areas of economic vibrancy that everyone else takes for granted. So I'd like to hear more about well, that. Well, uh, I actually started off my time as governor being picketed by, and mayor, being picketed by ADAPT everywhere I went. And by the end, I was their favorite governor because we adopted money follows the individual. But the problem is you could do it because you're a lawyer. You're, you, you know the issues. You know what's the best care to fashion. But I won't, I can't see you well enough to figure out how much, age, how old you are. But the average 75, 80 year old poor person has no ability to make those choices for themselves. They have no ability. That's the problem with converting Social Security uh, or, uh, into, a, uh, into a, a, a program where you get, a, you, the individual gets money and is told to go out, excuse me, Medicare into a program where the individual's told, here's your money, go out and buy health care for yourself. Think of a lot of 80-year-olds, you know, poor 80-year-olds. They wouldn't have a clue to be able to do that. And if they don't have anybody in their family willing to do it for them, they'd be lost. So I imagine you could do it and do it well. But having said that, I agree. There are, it's important to find ways, tenable ways, to get individuals into the marketplace themselves, making those decisions. But I'm not sure that I know the answer to that. Judd, do you want to take a shot at it? Well, I, I actually think that uh, there's a fairly large segment of the Medicare and Medicaid population who, if given the opportunity to make choices, would make a lot better choices than what the government does for them. So uh, premium support makes sense as an option. It shouldn't be a requirement. But uh, clearly, if you can run a premium support, which is a pejorative these days, but basically it means people get a, a money in order to go out and buy their health care, and they're given... Like, well, it's exactly what's going to happen with the exchanges, by the way. I mean, it's what the president is proposing in his exchanges is that you go into an exchange and you're going to get 20 or 30 different health care programs, which you theoretically are going to be willing to purchase from. 
uh, why not turn Medicare into the same type of system for people who are capable of doing it? There are going to be a lot, as you mentioned, as people age up, and even some who don't age up, they're not going to be able to make those choices. But you can certainly protect those folks and give them a standard old Medicare system, which probably is pretty bad, uh, and at least give people who want to use the system of choice to get what they want in the healthcare arena uh, with the dollars that are available to them and get it probably much more effectively and efficiently uh, from the provider groups. And the key here, I think, is I go back to what the key is, in my opinion, is it's one, to reward outcomes, and two, to capitate the system in a way that gives people an incentive, the providers, an incentive to to serve a person not based on utilization but on outcomes. And I agree with that. And if Judd were fashioning the program, I'd be very comfortable with some form of premium support optional. But often the Republicans produce premium support at a level that nowhere in, in America you could purchase health insurance for the year with the money that they're making available. I remember, it was Alice Rivlin's idea. She's not a Republican. Well, but still, the premium support only works you give a senior citizen premium support and you say, here, good news, we're giving you $800 a month to buy your health care. The number's got to be a reasonable number. But, well, but, but it, in a lot of the plans I've seen, the number isn't reasonable. And that, there, there's the rub. I mean, first of all, health care companies... Well, actually, are not, managed care is basically premium support, and people who are in managed care are pretty happy with it, usually. Right, but it's managed care where there's an overview and where they have the purchasing power of the group. That's, that's the capitation. Right. We're getting really technical here, by the way. I Sorry. We lose a lot of your audience when we get into this stuff. But a good question. Thank you. This is a lot of detailed stuff to listen to. And it strikes me that the two of you seem to agree that there are many common sense problem, uh, situations that can be solved with common sense. My question to both of you is why is it you, you both believe the Congress has become so polarized that they can't come to these common sense decisions. Great, great question. I'm going to take first shot at it because I know he, the governor's going to have even a better response than he's going to top me with it. But two reasons. Two things have fundamentally changed in the Congress since I was elected. The first is the House is now 60 to 65 percent redistricted by party. So that when you run for one of these House seats, you win your primary, you're the member of Congress. Now, to win a primary in the United States means you've got to speak to the base of your party. And so when these folks get to the Congress, the one thing their base will not, will not uh, tolerate is compromise. So the one thing those folks can't do is cross the aisle to govern. And in our society, we're not a parliamentary system. You've got to govern in a bipartisan atmosphere very rarely do we have a situation where you don't need bipartisanship. We had it for the first two years of President Obama. We had it during Lyndon Johnson, but it's a rare experience. Our system requires, especially on big issues where every American's affected, like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and taxes, they want to know that the solution is fair. And fairness, by definition, is bipartisanship. But the House is locked down on the issue of governance because people just can't go across the aisle. The and so the only way you can deal with that is you've got to get the momentum for a bipartisan agreement coming out of the Senate with presidential leadership. And there is in the Senate right now a working center on these big policy issues, I believe, of 50 to 60 people. And then the president has to lead and take that agreement to the House and allow the president to give the cover to get enough votes so that the, along with the speaker they can get over this systemic problem of the House not being able to govern in a compromising way or a bipartisan way. The second big issue, quite honestly, is the fact that thoughtful discussion on these complex issues has been driven off the playing field, primarily by social media. It is so vitriolic, so aggressively opinionated that there really isn't a discussion going on. You know, when I was in the House, I used to hold town meetings all over New Hampshire all the time. And I have to admit, I usually held them on Monday night so nobody would come because of Monday night football. But <laughs> actually, a few people did show up. And usually there'd be, in the, and this was in the 80s, there'd be in, the, in one side of the room, there'd be four or five people who were former SDS members. 
And on the other side of the room, there'd be four or five people who were read Trim Magazine, which was the John Birch Society publication. And after the meeting was over, they'd get together in the back of the room, not together, but I mean their groups would get together, and they'd exchange thoughts because they'd finally met. This was the only place they could meet. Now they meet on social media, and they have this massive megaphone, and they drown out folks who want to talk thoughtfully about the issues. And it really, I think it's, it's a great event, social media, but it's debilitating thoughtful discussion on complex issues, uh, which require that people be willing to listen to the other side in order to make progress. So those are the two th structural problems I think we have right now. And I agree with that, but I also think the problem exists because politicians, again, both sides of the aisle, are afraid to tell their constituents the truth because they don't think we're smart enough to handle the truth. And in essence, we can. I mean, the Democrats kowtowed on Social Security and Medicare, and we lost the senior citizen vote to Mitt Romney. How is that possible? It's because seniors are smarter. Seniors are smarter. I don't know how many of you watch Morning Joe, but if you do, you've heard Joe Scarborough say when he was campaigning in the panhandle of Florida, he would tell seniors that there had to be change and reform if Social Security and Medicare were going to survive. And they understood it. If I tell a group of seniors, hey, when Social Security was put into place, the average life expectancy was 65. Today, the average life expectancy is almost 80. And if you live to be 65, it's 85. And Social Security was never meant to cover 20 years. Do you hear? If you're talking to a group of seniors, you see them nodding. So, of course, we've got to change the age level. City citizens aren't dumb. People in general aren't dumb. We're just afraid to talk. The b biggest example of that, and I <laughs> this, don't mean to open a can of worms, was on the gun issue, on universal background checks. How in the Lord's name did Kelly Ayotte, was she unwilling to support what 90% of New Hampshireites wanted? And when she was asked why, she said, well, it was going to establish the first step towards establishing a registry. Well, the bill makes it a felony to do anything with that information that would establish a registry. Just trust, trust, trust people. People are smarter than we give them credit for. People are more reasonable than we give them credit for. Judge Wright, that some of the primary voters aren't all that reasonable and can't be. But even still, you can build coalitions of reasonable people. Trust, trust the voters, trust the people, and we don't do it anymore. Well, just on behalf of Kelly, let me point, make the point that probably nobody in our state has a stronger record of taking on criminal activity. She was the number one homicide prosecutor in the state for years. Then she was attorney general appointed by two governors, both Republican and Democrat. And as attorney general, she tried the only homicide case that was a capital murder case, got a conviction. The individual will probably be executed first time in the state's history, modern times anyway, since the 30s, because of the heinousness of his crime. So I don't think, I think you got to respect that Kelly knows what law enforcement's about and the importance of, of law enforcement. All that may be true, Judd, but Kelly Ayad should have, her performance should have spawned a rash of sale of my book, A Nation of Wusses, <laughs> because she was the perfect epitome of a wuss. I don't agree. Okay, let's, well, let's, let's, go let's to, move on. Gotta, yeah. <laughs> I can't agree with that. We wanted a little... We're not going yeah, yeah, right. to fight New Hampshire politics tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from the floor that was written um, that uh, if Sim Simpson Bowles is so good, how do we get it reconnected? And what can citizens do about this issue? Well, um, go ahead. Well, real quick. Write your congressman, write your senator, say, I do think the debt is important. I think we need to do something about it now. I don't want to burden on my grandkids with it. And Simpson Bowles is a reasonable format. Go. Simple letter, email, whatever. Do it. Go on the, the Campaign to Debt, our website, sign the petition. We have 369,000 Americans who have signed our petition. But better than signing a petition, write an individual letter to your congressman or senator. Well, that will certainly help. But I think, unfortunately, Gail's admonishment at the beginning that with the debt coming, deficits coming down, with so many other issues now coming to the front of the line, 
that the intensity needed to get a really comprehensive agreement has been waning. And the question is, will there be another pressure point? And Gail made the point that the last pressure, serious pressure point was when the Speaker of the House took on the debt ceiling in order to get action. Uh, the action led to the sequester and it led to the fiscal cliff tax increase. Whether or not there'll be any stomach for having a real confrontation that causes action is, I think, very problematic. And therefore, you're going to have to have leadership. And the president's going to have to lead. In my opinion, this is a leadership issue for the president. If he wants, you know, he can leave his term of office and he probably won't have the crisis. We probably won't have the financial crisis that's going to occur because our debt won't have accumulated to that point. But is it absolutely clear, it is unavoidable that within certainly the foreseeable future, we will have a fiscal crisis in this con country driven by the fact that people lose confidence in our debt because they know we can't repay it. And that'll probably be a crisis of, driven by people fearing inflation. Uh, and that'll be a legacy because most of this debt, you know, you can blame George W. Bush as much as you want, but most of this debt will have been added in the last four years, the last eight years, and it's going to be added as we go forward into the next four years and the next eight years. And unless you change these entitlement programs so they're affordable five, 10, 15 years out, you cannot correct this problem. But again, and I think Judge Wright, and I've talked about presidential leadership all the time, but when the president mentioned change CPI in the fiscal cliff negotiations, why did nothing come of it? Because Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans took a walk on change CPI. So they've got to show if the president leads, Republicans and Democrats both have to respond and respond honestly. For once, we've got to put campaigning on the back burner and try to do something about it. Judd has a great, backstage uses a great analogy about a train and where we are in terms of the debt issue. Well, uh, you know, the train is coming, it's just stopped blowing his whistle. And, but it's, gonna, it's, it's coming at us and we're in the tunnel and uh, there's no way out unless you figure out how to slow that train down. And the only way you can slow it down is slow the rate of the, the growth of these programs <coughs> down, in my opinion. Uh, I would say the change CPI, I want to give the president credit for that. I mean, I think it was a, a very significant give and that it stepped on the toes of his constituencies. And uh, even though it didn't mean much in the first 10 years for solving the immediate $5 trillion problem, in the second 10 years it's a trillion dollars, in the third 10 years it's probably 3 or $4 trillion. Mm -hmm. And it was stepping on the toes of some folks in his party who really didn't want it to go that way. So I respect him for having put that on the table. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our program. Unfortunately, uh, two things. Number one, it's a, a little bit uh, late this evening, and also it's really hot in here, if you didn't notice. And so uh, we're going to uh, wrap up this evening. Um, uh, while we uh, have a couple of closing items, uh, Kraft has uh, put a, a summary together uh, that has some of the points of common ground that were found, and he's going to put those. We're going to put those up on the screen. And uh, as we get those up there, uh, just a couple of questions. That's, uh, uh, that's not revenue enhancement, it's tax reform. What? Tax reform, not revenue enhancement. Where, where are you? Revenue expenditures. Fix. Okay, tax so. There's uh, some of us who believe through tax right, reform right. you can generate more revenue, you don't have to raise revenue. Down. Okay, so we'll make that adjustment. Um, the first question for everyone is how many of you feel that, uh, given the side that you uh, have an affinity for, got an understanding, a little more understanding about the other side and the way the other side views the question. Raise your hands. Okay, so that's about 45, 50 percent of you. Very good. And um, how many of you feel that uh, you saw some points of common ground here identified that you had not seen before? These were different ideas that you had not seen. Okay, so that's also about 50 percent of the audience. Very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, we are a Common Ground Committee, and we are about demonstrating that change is possible and that we can find common ground and make progress without compromising fundamental principles. Thanks again for your time this evening, and good evening. Thank you.